Welcome to the sixth episode of Dividend Discussion here on Dividend Obsession. With this new series, one of my goals is to share my passion for passive income through dividend investing with others. During these interviews, you're going to hear the story of someone else doing dividends their own way. Hopefully, you, the viewer, can take something out of each and every one of these interviews to make yourself a better dividend investor. For my sixth guest, please join me in welcoming Brad. He began investing many years ago at his employer via the advice of his grandfather and has a lot of lessons that he has learned and he would like to pass on. In this episode, we discuss things from getting started to long-term goals and everything in between. But without further delay, please enjoy the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Dividend Discussion. I am here today with my friend, Brad. Brad, if you wouldn't mind giving yourself a brief introduction, you can share a little bit about your background and how you got into investing and what kind of investor you were when you first started. Thank you, Troy. I appreciate being here with you. I really enjoy your content. And uh, so who am I? I'm Brad Cordell. I'm uh, from Northwest Missouri. I uh, was born up here and have lived around the area pretty much ever since. Um, so my background as far as work goes has been in IT. Um, I work at a local hospital and uh, I do. I have done IT support for there. My experience at the hospital got me into several different areas. One of them's in the cardiac area. I've learned how to read EKG patterns and uh, that kind of thing, and it's kind of served me ever since. But to start at the very beginning, uh, I got started investing by getting employed at our local Walmart, and uh, my grandfather uh, made mention that. You know, at Walmart, it's not too bad a company. And we're talking about when I'm 17 in 1987 when I started this. And he says, you know, you could do a lot worse than to buy the company stock if they let you. And one thing they did when I was filling out my W-2s and all my withholding was, do you want to do the company stock purchase plan? I said, sure, how much could it be? You know, and they said, well, you make not much an hour because it was a minimum wage job in 87, but... You know, I was able to figure I could do $10, $12 every paycheck and buy some stock. I started in October of 87, right as the market collapsed on, uh, what was it, Black Monday, Black Friday. And, uh, you know, I saw the stock ticker outside the uh, office there above the water fountain. One day it was a little, lot more than it was the day that I signed up for that stock purchase pro program. But in the end, it kind of uh, worked out for me. As time went by, I figured out how many hours I could do, how to uh, set aside more money out of the, out of the uh, check for more stock purchases. And uh, that really got me on my way. It uh, took me a couple of years to uh, finish that job and move on to the other things that uh, served me well later on in life. And uh, he when he started with our local telephone utility, did the same thing, moved on to our now local electric utility. He retired from there in 91, but he was able to uh, set aside uh, several dollars and uh, even his dividends were buying his automobiles once he retired. He would get uh, you know a dollar a share every year and as it added all up, he had enough to uh, get himself a new pickup, another car, whatever it took, whatever was uh, pressing at the time. So that was uh, greatly influential on me at the beginning. And the kind of investor I was at the beginning was probably your dollar cost averager. You know, I was setting aside that 10, 11, $12 a pay period. I think, you know, I finally maxed it out at 62, 50 or something like that for pay period at the end. And, uh, watching that, uh, calling up Mer the Merrill Lynch, uh, automated line, press one for your share balance. And I would find out that I had more shares and uh, press two to find out how much that's worth as of today's close closing price. Yeah, I had a few dollars in there after a time. And uh, so that was the dollar cost averaging of the thing. Now to skip ahead a little bit. Now I'm uh, working at the hospital by this time. Found a lady in my life that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. I, uh, it occurred to me that I was probably going to have to do just a little more than save money. And I'm, uh, going into another job that I picked up down at the airport. And, uh, 
I stop at my quick trip on the way in. Usually I'm picking up Baseball Digest, Sporting News, or whatever it is I want to read about. But there's the uh, August of 94 edition of Kiplinger's Magazine, which I'm going to share in a link to you. And it's, uh, it's what really set me. It's like, yeah, you know, that's probably something I need to look into a little bit more. And uh, read the book, read the magazine, that is. And uh, it told me I could start with a little bit and just some company that I'd find interesting. And they had a list in there, too. They had some mutual funds. I know I called a lot of 800 numbers to get more information, including a prospectus on all these different funds. But my mailman was a little busy after that. But uh, <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Uh, it... Uh, it really just occurred to me that I had a great responsibility coming on with uh, making a new family. And uh, this fellow they featured in that issue had the same thing going on. And he was talking about, you know, finding companies that that had possibilities for for uh, the future because he family man with uh, three kids. And uh, I could see that happening to myself down the ride, down the uh, road a little ways. It was really eye-opening when I first started. I had a fella locally that uh, was able to get me single shares and do dividend reinvestment plans. Mm. And uh, he decided he wasn't going to deal with small potatoes like me, that he wanted me to just uh, set aside some money in his mutual funds there in the house that they had. And I decided that I didn't need his advice. So I did find another... uh, fella in Kansas City that I wound up doing a lot of business with, getting some single shares and enrolling in these dividend reinvestment plans. My first was uh, my first was RPM International, which is also uh, featured in a Beardstown Ladies Investment book that I read way back then that, you know, they didn't wind up to uh, be that successful. I think they were proven that they uh, – had figured their returns wrong. So ultimately that book was helpful in getting me uh, on the right trajectory. But uh, when it came to uh, doing it, I did the dividend reinvestment plans with RPM, then Harley Davidson, and then Hormel Foods, mm-hmm. a local uh, phone company that we used here. And uh, it was just that Peter Lynch stuff about investing in what you know, looking in my cupboard and finding that I've got General Mills and I've got uh, Hormel Foods and uh, good Lord, there's just all kinds of stuff around you if you just pay attention. Yeah. Where do you like to spend your time if it's in a theater or a restaurant and all of them are publicly traded? It's uh, really amazing uh, what you figure out if you just pay attention to what's going on around you. Yeah, the, the wife... Uh... I don't know that she even likes that I do it anymore, but like anytime we're watching TV and there's a commercial for whoever it is, it's an Apple commercial, it's an AbbVie commercial, it's a it's a Procter and Gamble commercial, it's a Johnson and Johnson commercial. I'm just like I, I always call out whoever pays dividends. Um, it's exactly. kind of like a, a little pop quiz for myself where I'm like, okay, like I gotta remember these companies, I gotta remember who they what like uh, little companies they have under like the big company umbrella and like all those kinds of stuff. Um, so it's, it's really cool for me to see that. And like, like you said, it is, uh, just walking around, looking in your house, you'd probably be very surprised to see one, how many companies are in your house that are publicly traded. Uh, and then two, how many of those publicly traded companies also pay dividends. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good investment, but it's at least a place to start. Like you're already a consumer of them. Other people are consumers of them. Therefore they're making money and that's a good place to start. So. Yeah, if you look at the umbrella of companies that are under Disney or just what they have their fingers on as far as entertainment and streaming and uh, uh, parks and uh, everything, I've seen a great illustration about that. I don't have it to share with you, but maybe I can find it to put up later. But uh, there's an amazing amount. 3M is another one that makes so many different things. And uh, even uh, the... Things from earplugs to face masks to uh, stuff I use at work. Um, it's another, really tremendous. An, another one that's got like a surprisingly large product line is like Pepsi. 
because uh, yeah. everybody always compares, you know, Pepsi and Coke and, and Coke really stays in like the beverage space, but Pepsi has branched out far beyond the beverage space, which is pretty wild to see. You know, I even found a shirt that has all the logos of Pepsi, Scott Tropicana, Quaker, PepsiCo, Frito-Lay, mm -hmm. and I've got the hat too with the same logos on it. Yeah, but, it's, uh, it's kind of some of the biggest brands you can ever think of. You're like, oh, that's probably like its own brand. Nope. Most probably if you walk down that snack food aisle, most of that stuff's probably uh probably under Pepsi somehow, some way. Right, and Gatorade. That was part of the Quaker yep. takeover when they took Quaker, they got Gatorade too. Yep. Okay, so that that's super cool. I that I appreciate your backstory there. And it's it's really cool to see that uh your grandfather, you said when you were seventeen got you into Walmart. Um, and that was like it's I've asked this question before. It seems like most people seem to like stumble into dividends. Like you didn't even necessarily buy Walmart because of the dividend. Um, you really bought it because you worked there and, you know, it was advice of your grandfather and, um, you know, you got the employee, you know, stock compensation, stuff like that. So like what do you still own Walmart out of curiosity? Out of curiosity. Yeah, I still have some Walmart. It's in my brokerage account now. I took it out of the Lloyd plan and, and uh, rolled it into uh, my brokerage account. It's still there today. Is it what? What's your cost basis on that? Oh, good lord, that's that's a good question. That's and that's, I probably got it figured out. Yeah, that'd be just super cool to see. Like I, I always love because like I haven't been in the dividend investing game for that long, so like I don't have any like, you know, I hear people talking telling stories like, oh yeah, my cost basis on Apple's nine dollars. I'm like, I don't have any of those, any of those stories yet. I have a, a lot of years to go for that. But people that have been, I know it's over ten dollars, but probably under twenty for a lot of those shares. Yeah, that's so and, crazy. Uh, yeah, that's, and that's uh, really you cool. know, even after I was at Walmart, I enrolled in their dividend reinvestment plan with a single share I rolled out of there, or no, it was a direct purchase plan through their computer share transfer agent, hmm. and uh, I I continued to put fifty dollars in every month on an automated debit. And, you know, that's been a real uh, success story too, is figuring out which one of these companies will allow for automated debit. And you just set it and forget it and let that money come out of your uh, bank account and go in there and get the statement and collect statements all year long. Yeah. Yeah. The more, the more uh, hands off, like that's the thing. Everybody wants to do it. Like, people want to do individual stocks because individual stocks are fun um, versus ETFs where it's like, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Like you don't really worry about it. You just buy the ETF and do that. Um, but if you wanted to do individual stocks, you can, there's ways that you can make it uh, more automated than it is like, okay, I have to do the initial research of those individual stocks is typically the most uh, time intensive. And then sure. after that, like once you've identified that company, you just make sure it still fits whatever your criteria might be. And then you can, like you said, set up the reoccurring investment, $50 a week, $50 every two weeks, a month. It doesn't matter as long as money's going in over time. Um, and that's kind of one of the lessons that you learned being at Walmart, where it was just coming out of your check when you said dollar cost averaging, you weren't worried about, oh, what, what are they saying on the news about Walmart? And like, what, here's this hoopla and this something's wrong over here or whatever. It was just like, okay, I don't, I, I don't know what the price is. I don't know any of those things. I'm just going to put money in. And in the long run, it'll work out because Walmart's a, a good, reputable, well-known company that, it, you know, constantly produces cash flow and can, you know, give it back to their shareholders. So. Yeah. Right on that. Uh, it's something that I just didn't have to, uh, really uh, give much consideration to it all. Like I said, that uh, price chart above the water fountain uh, would change as the as the uh, different closing prices were posted. But you know, I never ever sweated that. Mm -hmm. It was just something that I thought, that money just keeps adding up. I call that 800 number of Merrill and find out that there's more shares in there. And that's really all that, that's really all I focused on was just continuing to accumulate and in later years, that's what I continued to focus on was just accumulating, knowing that what I picked, I picked for good reasons already. And uh, everything was taking care of itself. You know, I've had a couple of terrible decisions that I've made, but uh, and we can talk about that at short length if you want to later on. But, yep. uh, but uh, we've all figured out that uh, what's good for us and what isn't good for us in due time. Yeah. Yeah. And I always try to say like, one of my big, big sayings is like, you have to learn from mistakes, but nobody said they have to be yours. Um, yeah. You that, can learn from a lot of people's mistakes. Exactly. Yeah. You can learn from everybody else's mistakes, but sometimes the mistakes that are 
the ones that actually stick around or like the, the lessons that are actually learned are the mistakes that you have to make on your own. So like, you know, we're part of that dividend group on Facebook and, and you know, I see a lot of people that are younger than me that are in their early, early twenties or late teens that have portfolios with 13, 14, 15% yields. And I'm like, okay, like no matter how many comments they get on their posts, like of everybody saying, Hey, you know, this might not be right for where you are in your journey. Um, not to say it's never right, but when you're 17 years old, 18 years old, like you don't need 20% yields. Like that's probably not sustainable. Um, but no matter how many comments they get and how many people have been there, done that, um, sometimes they just have to make that mistake on their own to actually learn the lesson. And, and that's fine. Like you just hope that um, if they started that early and they're making that mistake, that they can also learn their mis- learn their lesson sooner rather than later. That way they may they, maybe it takes them three years and they were 17 when they started takes them three years of chase and yield. They waste three years of their investing to learn that lesson. And then from 20 all the way to 65, they can actually do it right and, and take those lessons and apply them to be a successful dividend investor. So. Yeah. hundred percent. That's, that's a fact. Uh, you won't, uh, you won't uh, get rich by doing dumb things. You'll get rich over time from doing what's well, right. Mm-hmm. That's all there is to that. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, okay. So next question for you is, yeah. so the next question was going to be like, what, uh, what inspired you to do dividend investing? But you kind of answered that with like starting at Walmart and like getting into that. Um, and then you bought, uh, companies that were in your, in your house, which were dividend Correct. payers. Um, so we're going to move on to the next one, unless you have anything to add to that. No, as far as, uh, focusing on dividends by themselves is, you know, you can get, uh, dividend champions, dividend, uh, challengers and uh you know i found an insurance company that appealed to me just because it looked like that's what it could be down the line it looked like it was making money year after year and you know they even paid specials at the end of the year and that were several dollars sometimes and uh that's just something you know you kind of want to uh you just kind of wonder if it's gonna keep going the way it always had been going and you know, you you uh, do enough research to find out what they do and uh, how they run their investment portfolio. And, uh, you know, it's uh, that's what uh, I'm sorry, but uh, some of these things, you know, it's just kind of evident when when uh, you do more research about them. There was a time when I'd be up at our library reading the value line investment survey. And that's how I found that insurance company. And uh, as a new initiated coverage, and uh, and they, the, you know, their numbers rose steadily. It wasn't something that was going to be an overnight success, but it was an over decade success for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really important to um, understand about that too, is like, I, I, there's so many people, whether it's the penny stocks or the, the cryptos or whatever it is, like the, I think it was Jeremy that was talking about it. And I think Chad talked about it too. The, there's the, the glamour, the glitz and the glamour of, you know, getting rich quick and having nice things and spending all your money and all these things. But for most people, at the end of the day, it, it's the slow and steady wins the race, ha- building good principles and characteristics to understand that in good and bad markets, like investing and just keep investing, keep investing, keep investing, actually get you where you need to go. Um, oftentimes you could argue quicker because like some of the people that tried to go for that super quick lifestyle and all kinds of stuff like that, they never get there versus, you know, me or you or anybody else that takes their time to do it. We get there. It might take a long time, but it's, pretty sharp, pretty, pretty darn guaranteed that you're going to get there if you do it right. So. Yeah. The journey is uh, what matters, you know, uh, the destination is important, but you know, doing the right things and uh, keeping that behavior up over time regularly and uh, steadily and, uh, you know, looking out for new opportunities and evaluating what you have to see that that's still what needs to be done. Yeah. I agree. Okay. So here's, here's a fun one for you. This is a new question. What are yeah. some key my, or yeah. What are some key milestones slash achievements you've reached in your dividend journey so far? Well, that would be in several accounts uh, where they start buying their own additional shares, you know, the dividend will pay and, and uh, you wind up picking up one more share 
And of course, there's the there's the milestones. Like I remember in 2000, I had everything stored on Yahoo, my portfolio. And uh, when you click over certain numbers, when you get a five-digit portfolio, you get a I suppose a six-digit portfolio. We're talking about a hundred thousand, but uh, it's out there. Yeah, as far as actually achieving them. Okay, I've I've done all right. I'll put it that way. I just uh, when you when those odometer milestones hit the hundred thousand miles, mm-hmm. the dollar amounts, the dividend amounts, um, but milestones and you know when you get enough shares that you're buying more, and you finally have a hundred shares in your account, and you finally get three hundred shares in your account, or when you can call the transfer agent and say, you know, I'd like to uh, get a certificate for a couple hundred shares of this. And then I wind up putting it in that brokerage account with all the Walmart stock I rolled from Merrill. So those are, uh, have been some huge milestones. You know, I've had a health challenge recently this uh, past year. And uh, I've uh, been able to turn that spigot from reinvestment into payouts mm. and uh, rather than buying more shares, I've just been able to shore up uh, the uh, income that uh, I was missing due to uh, being a little out of service. That is all over now. As far as uh, being out of service, I'm back back on and uh, back to just about 100% now. That's so good to hear. Uh, being able to shut that dividend reinvestment off and to get the checks deposited into the account, just like it used to take money out, it's going back in. Mm-hmm. And it's time to turn that spigot back on to reinvest again, but it's coming. But until then, you know, I still have uh, good ideas for for uh, the dividends that I do have paid. They'll, you know, they'll get invested into uh, other stocks in the brokerage account instead. Yeah, that's, that's a... Another super cool thing about dividend investing is people that are, are watching or listening, you'll notice that he said all he did was turn off the drip to help him supplement his income while he was down and out of service. Um, he never had to sh- sell those shares. He keeps the shares versus if you are strictly a uh, growth investor where you're buying companies that don't pay dividends, like so, let's just say your, your Metas, your Amazons, your Teslas, stuff like that. In order for Brad to get money out of those stocks, if those were only stocks he held, he would have to sell shares or, or maybe not all of his position, but at least part of his position, um, which, you know, then he, ha- then he would have to turn around and build that back up whenever he was back in commission. But it, with dividend investing, you can use the money that those companies are giving you to increase your stake exponentially in addition to the new money that you're going to add. Or if something does come up, you can always turn that off and have all those, those dividends that you're getting just added to your, your account. And then you can use that to, you know, like, like, like he did supplement his income in, in trying times, which is always a really nice, you know, ace to keep in your back pocket. So that's super cool. Yeah. Um, okay. It's so been, it's been super, I'll tell you, I knew it, it would be a possibility at one point that I'd retire and that's how I would spend my retirement was just living off what dividends would pay. But uh, call it an early retirement or at least a, uh, a uh, what would you call it? It's just a trial run at retirement. I'm not quite that old yet, but uh, I'll be 53 here in a few days. So it's uh it was a trial run at what retirement might be like living off dividend income. So that's super cool and happy early birthday, by the way. Um, well, thanks. Okay. So next one. Um, so I re- first of all, I really do like what you said about the, the drip buying full shares because like I keep track of so many numbers on my spreadsheet and now to, like, I think it's with like Exxon mobile and Abvi. Those are two of my bigger payers. Like I'm starting to get to the point where the drips, it's only, there's no zeros in front of the the decimal anymore, or I guess behind the decimal. So it's now it's like 0.203 or 0.225 shares is what it's buying. And I used to get excited when I'm like, oh, I'm getting 0.025 free shares from my drip. And then now the decimal place moved over one. And now I'm just getting 0.225 shares. And like, I know it's going to get really exciting 
probably next year when I'm getting half a share every time they pay me. So that means by the end of the year, that company bought two of its own shares for me just off of the dividend reinvestment. And then that keeps snowballing. And then that turns into, like you said, a whole share or three shares or four shares or 10 shares or whatever it is. So that's super, super cool. That's a, a milestone I didn't really, I track it, but I never really thought to put like a um, excitement level behind it. But that is, that's pretty cool. So I'm glad you said that. Um, okay. So do you notice that those achievements and milestones that you spoke about, do they like, do they help with your motivation? Because that you, like you said, dividend investing is a long journey. So like does having individual achievements and milestones that you set up, do they help keep you motivated or do you get your motivation somewhere else? Every time, every time it comes, it's just more fuel to the fire to be honest with you. That's it's cool. just, uh, Oh my, how do I put this? It's, uh, you know, it's fuel to the fire. I've already had the fire about building this, uh, legacy for my family. And, uh, it's, uh, every time that thing pays, it grows. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or my bank account deposit, it pays a bill for me. You know, it's just, uh, terribly motivating. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, it's it, it is cool. Like the um, the constant reminder that you're on the right path, um, like it does help to track um, your progress, both like in terms of income and like Chad really, you know, harps on the total return because that's super important. Um, so keeping track of all those metrics and then the ability to go back and like, you know, zoom out from instead of looking at your portfolio on an individual stock basis. Look, zoom out and be like, okay, well, how's this, the, how's that stock doing? How's my portfolio doing? How much am I making now versus how much I was making at this time last year? Like those kind of things really can keep you motivated since it is such a long journey. Um, you'll see people in, you know, different, different investment circles that are like, oh yeah, you know, I made 36% today. But what they don't tell you is they lost 200% every day before that. Um, right. So it's, it's like, that's super cool. I think that's super important too, is to find, find little things, especially when you first get started. I've said this in other interviews. When you first get started, the numbers are so small. Like you might literally get um, 35 cents this month in dividends and next next month it's a dollar and 19 cents or whatever it might be. Um, when you have something to track it, you're focused on the percentages. Like year over year, I'm up 300, 400, 500, 600%, whatever the number is. And those percentages are crazy growth. And as those percentages start to decline, your dollar amounts are going to start to go up. So like, I, for instance, in the month monthly recap that I just released for May, that was my best month ever in my retire early account. I think it was like a hundred and something dollars that I made that that's now that's its own motivation. Like that's now a hundred dollars that I got for not doing anything, which is it's more than passive. enough to, yeah, that pays for like a grocery bill for a week or my phone bill or all your streaming services or whatever. Now, like you said, I'm dripping those. So like, I'm not, I didn't technically pay those things. But if I did have a bad month, I could have turned the drip off of all those things and paid one or two of my bills, which is great. So that's super yeah, It's cool. about what it can do. It's not uh, and whether it can buy more shares or whether it can sustain you. You know, that's what matters. Yeah, I agree. OK, so next one for you. What are some short term financial goals that you've set for yourself and how do dividends play a role in achieving those goals? Short-term goals are, well, um, I'll be 59 and a half here before the end of this decade. And uh, is that short-term enough for you? But uh, what I'm looking at is putting money in the proceeds of uh, some of these dividends into other. Well, let's see. Well, I'm looking at uh, companies like business development companies, some closed-in funds that uh, and, and some, some, uh, ETFs that follow industries that, uh, I'm fairly interested in, or at least know that there's a long runway ahead for them to, uh, grow for me. And, uh, in addition, provide some extra streams of income down the line. I've got a 401k with the employer that, that I plan on, uh, setting up with, uh, some of these ETFs and, uh, closed in funds that, uh, you know, I think is going to pay off down the line. Uh, long run, uh, this will just generate more income that I can 
put into some more ideas or at least existing investments that I've already got going on. Uh, but then that turns into a longer term goal, but short term, that's, that's what I've got uh, in front of me is maybe doing the retirement thing. Maybe not. We'll see how that goes, but it's a definite possibility. I do know that. Yeah, that's super cool. Cause a lot of things with dividend investing too, is you can, um, there's still projections that have to go into it. Like, okay, this company's currently got a, you know, 15% five year dividend growth rate. Like, do I think in 10 years they're going to have a 15% dividend growth rate? Well, like what do their numbers say? And like, you do have to project forward a little bit, but there's also like, typically I'll be on the conservative side with any of my projections. So I take all of my current numbers that I'm getting and I divide them by half. So I'm like, okay, my portfolio average is 10% dividend growth rate. By the time I need these funds, I'm projecting them to grow at 5% a year. What does that do? And you plug that into several different calculators you can find on the internet. You can really see. And like I said, my goal is to retire early at 50. Um, so I have 22 years left to do that. And I think I can get there. Worst case scenario, if I have to work a, a, a year, two, three years extra, um, just to like find, like to fully sure up that plan, um, I can do that. Or pretend I have to work until, you know, 59 and a half, 60, 65, whatever it is. And my, de my dividend plan never really came to fruition. Maybe it doesn't fully replace income that I would have had. And, you know, my goal was to have, a, I don't know, $80,000 a year in passive income just from dividends. Maybe I only get the 40 and I didn't necessarily achieve my goal, but it'd be really cool to just like look back and be like, oh, you know, I didn't get my goal, but I am making $40,000 a year from a job I don't work at. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, residuals from writing a book or, uh, I don't know, having a television show you're on pay you off just for being on the air. Yeah. Yeah, it's super cool. So, like, that's kind of like my – I really don't want to talk uh, – I don't try to bring that up too much because I kind of, like, you know, manifest, like, the my plan's going to work. I'm going to be able to retire early, all these things. But, like, the fallback plan of, like, if it didn't work, um, the – plan B of it is still, I'm going to get thousands of dollars a year in passive income from, to help me supplement, you know, my retirement lifestyle, whatever that might be. So, um, that's super cool on there too. So here's one for you. Um, how do you approach selecting dividend paying stocks or funds for your portfolio? Like, do you have specific criteria for your stocks need to meet or strategies that you follow? You know, uh, I, uh, I just look at the universe and uh, use screens to uh, narrow things down by how uh, how much they pay, how much they have paid, and uh, what that rate of change is. And, uh, you know, you have to make some projections like you just mentioned and some other assumptions because uh, all things being equal, this is my econ professor talking to me, but all things being equal, they aren't always equal. And, uh, and, uh, you know, eventually success will come to pass, but, uh, some things aren't going to work out. So you just have to weed out the things that may have sounded like a good idea at the time, but, you know, it just doesn't uh, fit the criteria that you have to do the job of, uh, making that dividend payment for you. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's you know, try and find stuff that's got a lot of uh, growth at reasonable prices, and then what that means is is you have to be able to wait for the right price, and sometimes that never comes. But the waiting is the hardest part. Yeah, yeah, that yeah that is that like. The thing that is uh, something to always think about, and I mean, thinking about it's not going to change it, but like with any stock picks that you do make, you make the assumption today that in the future it's going to meet whatever your future needs are and be at whatever you assumed the price or outcome of that stock would be. Um, and the only way to figure that out, if you're right, is to wait. Um, yeah. so it's, there's nothing you can, like, you can't fast forward and be like, okay, was this a good idea? And they're like, no, it wasn't like, let me rewind and then change my eye strategy and then fast forward again. Like, I don't know, maybe in 20 years we'll be able to do that where we can time travel and like not, maybe not necessarily change anything, but we can see if something does work and then like go back and see, you know, or you can see like decisions today impact you how in the future. Like I've always thought of that when I was, you know, I have dreams like that or where it's like, okay, 
if I make this decision and train my change my training style at the gym to do these things, what would I look like in five years by doing that or whatever? So it'd be really cool. I mean, I, I know we have that Neuralink that Elon Musk is talking about and all kinds of stuff. So who knows what we'll be able to do in the future. But for now, the only thing that we can do is make educated guesses and decisions today and then hope and evaluate, like hope over time that it works out the way we thought it would and evaluate over time to make sure it's on the right path. And if it's not, sometimes that's cutting ties. Sometimes it's reevaluating how you pick that stock in the first place to make sure you don't make that mistake in the future or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's certainly, uh, that's certainly the key is uh, you have to be able to learn from what you're doing and uh, what you've already done. It, it will give you a valuable education. Yeah, I agree. Actually, so this next question actually goes into that. So do you have any um, biggest, like what are your biggest selling regrets or your biggest buying brags? Like do you have any stocks that you bought um, at a really cheap price that are now worth a lot? And you, you want to you wanna talk about those or any stocks that you, you know, had a long time ago and you sold them way too soon and now they're, you'd be a billionaire by now? Well, I wouldn't be a billionaire by now, but I'm still working on it, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, it's not over. But, uh, you know, one of my bigger success stories is probably the evaluation of Hormel Foods. Um, and I wound up doing, you know, I started small, about $25 a month into that, month after month. And I raised it over time as I could afford it and would do some overtime and pull down a few more dollars. And I accumulated quite a few shares of Hormel over time. And, uh, well, uh, that's probably the my biggest success. Um, that insurance company I referred to earlier uh, was another pretty good decision, just based off the fact that it was a dividend challenger and and uh, set aside several dollars into that that one. Actually, twice a month it allowed for optional cash purchases twice a month, and uh, that's really worked out well. It's one of the ones that's kind of uh, be paying again this month that dividend that, uh, and by Christmas it should pay that special again if they're in the mood to pay a special again this year. But, uh, you know, I've done some real awful, uh, decisions over time. And, uh, once upon a time I bought an outfit called CML group. And what they did was they make, uh, the Nordic track skier, uh, Smith and Hawken garden tools. And, uh, something else but anyway that was a long time ago you know it got uh, cut down to i think it was around three dollars a share and i thought you know i think i'll see if i can just send in a check for thirty dollars and get me ten more shares of it but by the time the check got there it had dropped down to around three cents a share and bought me whatever it was three thousand shares of it but i found out the reason that was so poor was uh you know, stocks go down in price for a reason. And uh, the reason was it was a poorly run business. I think now Nordic Track and those other brands underneath it are part of another bigger bigger uh, firm now. It's been, been uh, gobbled up by somebody along the way. I really haven't looked at CML since 95 or 6. I think that's when I got in trouble with that or not in trouble, just kind of made an error in judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like I said, my, uh, I don't know if you've seen my, my May recap or not. Um, my, yeah. I mean, I freaking sold Nvidia go me. Um, but I mean, I, like I said, my returns on it were really, really good. So, I mean, I, I try not to cry over spilt milk too much. Like, okay. Yeah. I could have made, you know, a couple hundred more dollars, but I made hundreds of dollars. Actually, I think I made a couple th like, I don't know, $1,200 in actual in returns on that one. So um, bought a different company. Actually, you speaking about special dividends, Costco, the company I bought, they do special dividends every once in a while. Um, I've never, I don't think I've ever received a special dividend. So I'm looking forward to, uh, if Costco pays out a special dividend one of these years to, to get in that. Cause I think their last one was like five or $10 a share or something was the last one that they paid. I think it was in 2020 or 2021. Um, and I was like, man, if I can get like, you know, 10 shares or something of that by then 15, 20 shares, a hundred shares, whoever, however long it takes, um, that'll be a nice little, a little surprise that you get over there. So, yeah, I think you're not going to find anything wrong with being in Costco over the long time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, it wasn't one of those things where like I sold it and put it into something speculative or whatever. 
Um, it, like I, I mean, Nvidia has probably the lowest yield on the market. If I had to guess, like their yields point point zero yeah, it's, four. It's pretty something. small. Yeah. So like I, I actually made money, and I'm actually up on my Costco position. I think on Friday I looked, and it was you know up four and a half percent or something like that. Which I, you know, I'm not expecting it to go up four and a half percent every month. While wow, that would be nice, that's not realistic. So. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not fretting over it anymore. Like I like, it's kind of a funny story where I could be like, yeah, you know, I had it and then, uh, it was going down a little bit and I was like, okay, look, I, I look kind of smart. Actually, I really didn't even look at it when it was going down. I was like, I made my decision to sell. And then I was watching CNBC and they're like, yeah, uh, NVIDIA is up 25% after hours. I was like, of course it is. Like, why wouldn't it be up 25% after of course. hours? Yeah. Who, who, who would have thunk it? Um, okay. So, I mean, you kind of spoke on this a little earlier, but maybe you have another example of this too. Um, have you ever encountered any challenges or setbacks in your dividend investing journey? And if so, what were they and how did you overcome them? You know, the challenge is, is accumulating the, the shares. And, uh, so yeah, how did I approach it? I know I've got these milestones that I need to reach that I want to reach. It's a whole bunch of goals, but I, you know, I took on that job at the airport I was talking about earlier, and uh, I've used the skills that I've had to be able to uh, do other things. I've done some IT work for our local school district in the past. I've done, uh, I've just taken on a lot of uh, extra overtime, uh, other jobs. Uh, you know, I slung packages at FedEx for a long time, and before my kid was born, before my oldest was born. And, you know, that uh, that also had a stock purchase plan as well. So even though I'm slinging packages out of the trucks at FedEx, I'm buying more FedEx and uh, I'm making a few dollars an hour that uh, I wasn't making at my other job. Sure, I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning to get down there and pop the truck at 8 in the morning and, and uh, do all that. It was uh, definitely uh, something that, I don't know. It's just uh, your time is worth whatever you make it worth, and uh, if you can uh, if you can uh, sell yourself for that much more an hour, then uh, that's what you do. It's all about. Uh, so I don't think it was a real problem or setback, other than it was just a need to meet my goal and to uh, to uh, get that extra dollar so I could keep working the portfolio. Yeah, that's that's really big awareness on your end, though, is like a lot of people, um, they either say that there's no way that they can make more money or if they do make more money, it's for the uh, for fun expenses. Um, sure. But you you wanted to work really, really hard because you saw at a earlier time in your life that you could that this investing thing was working. The more money that you could put in it, the earlier you could put more money in it, the more it would work and work for you at all those things. So that's super, super key to see. Cause a lot of people, um, I, I try to talk to as many people about investing that, that want to listen to me. And I just tell them all the time. I'm like, yeah, like y y you have to, it's not too late to start at any point, but it's also one of those things of like the earlier you do start, the better it is. Um, whether it's learning the lessons and having time to recover from them, whether it's the compounding that you're going to get from it, whether it's the um, the sim there's all kinds of statistics and stuff that said, uh, you know, Susie invested, um, she maxed out her Roth IRA from 20 to 30 years old and didn't put any more money into it. And yeah. then Bob over here put his money in from 30 to 65 and Susie still had more money than Bob at the end of the, at the end of the 65. And I'm just like, that's, that's the power of compounding right there. And it's pretty wild to see. So for you to have that awareness where you're like, okay, how can I make extra dollars and how can I make those extra dollars work harder for me? So I don't have to work hard for extra dollars. If that makes sense. Uh, that's that's pretty, exactly right though. Yeah. I mean, you put it really well right there. Yeah. It's that's, that's great awareness on your end. So that's, that's pretty cool. Like my thing is, um, cause I have a, a five month old now and two, two dogs and the wife and I'm a power, a competitive power lifter and all kinds of things. So like those take most of my time and then the YouTube channel, obviously, uh, takes all my time. So like my big thing was like, okay, to me, it doesn't have to be an either or, but in the world where it was an either or, like how do I either increase income or reduce expenses? So I took the reduce expenses route where like I ba I live on less than half of what I make. So I can just put back more and more and more money. So like that, that was my path for it. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be an either or I could have done what you do. And I do the, the 
increase my income and reduce my expenses. And then I can live off of, you know, 30% or 20% of what I make. And that'd be even better. But yeah, that was the key for me. I had to watch what I spent because, you know, I've, I've got uh, outside interests other than investing. I big audio file. And, uh, well, if you could see behind me, I've got, uh, shelves full of records, tapes, CDs, mostly CDs, but, uh, you know, that stuff costs money over time. And, mm -hmm. I know that if I had taken the money that I spent on the music, that it would uh, be worth quite a bit more today because, for one, you got to find all this stuff, whether it's locally at, uh, at uh, oh, we had a, a trade trade post is what it was called, CD trade post. I'm not sure if you have those in your area of the woods or not. Mm -mm. I think they're in Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska now, so... But anyway, I would uh, accumulate a bit of that, too. Accumulate seems to be one of the biggest words I've had in my existence so far. It's all its all been about getting a little bit more and figuring out ways to do a little bit more all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, and then eventually the, the, the flip, <laughs> the switch flips, that's what I was trying to say, to the point where, like, you're going to want less and then you want to figure out how, like, Basically, what's the most that you can get out of something with doing the least amount of work? Like that's that's the best way. And that's what the passive income from dividends does. It's like, okay, you go from let's say you make $100,000 a year. You can go from making $100,000 a year having to wake up Monday through Friday, uh, you know, get to a job from nine to five, whatever it is. And if you could one day flip that switch to the point where you're making $80,000 a year and you wake up whenever you want and you don't have to go anywhere. Like that's a, it's less money or it could be more money or the same amount of money, but it's, it's, it's money for doing less work. And then as you get older, you have, you know, less energy and all kinds of stuff. And you can, you know, take a midday nap because you're tired and you don't, it doesn't, you don't have to be at work. You don't have to worry about, you know, falling asleep at your desk and your boss finding you or whatever. So, um, that's super cool. Yeah. I like, I, I really like your story with the, wanting to make more money. And then, like you said, it was accumulation and it, yeah, you could have taken that money that you used to buy those CDs and stuff for investments, but you also have to, it's a, del it's the balance of like, uh, you don't want to put a hundred percent of the money that you do save into investments. Cause then you don't get to enjoy today's life. Um, cause you know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. So. Yeah. It's a real balance. You know, you strike that balance between, uh, what you'd like to have, what you want to have. And, you know, somewhere in the middle there, you have, you have a, uh, real balance in life. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, okay. So we talked earlier about your short-term goals. So what are some of your long-term financial goals that you set for yourself? How do you see dividends contributing to them? And then if, so this is a question I, I ask everybody that's on here, cause I know I'm going to have an issue with it. So if your long-term goal is to make X amount of dollars and re like replace your income. Like, how will you know, you know, personally that enough is enough? Like, how do you d decide I don't need one more year. I'm done right now. Or I do need one more year. Cause this is the number I'm going for. Well, let's see. The long-term goal is to, uh, it's out there with a the short-term goal too, because it's not going to take that long comparatively speaking, because they're, they're starting to merge the short and long terms are starting to, uh, they're going to fuse out, out there at the end. And when I'll know it's enough is when I'm paying for everything that needs to be paid for. And it's not like we spend a hell, pardon my language, if we spend a lot of money on uh, stuff, uh, things. I mean, yes, if I have a mighty car expense or something that comes up that's going to, set me back a few dollars and you know i'm prepared for that kind of thing with uh reserves and uh everything will be able to take care of itself ultimately um but longer term i also think about investing on behalf of my kids and uh you know ensuring that that legacy is something that they can pass on to generations from now and uh I guess if you want to look at very, very long-term goals, because I've got my boy in something that actually is a callable uh, stock that uh, they don't have to call it until 81, I mean 2081. And uh, while I'll be over 100 by then, he won't be. And uh, 
he doesn't even he can collect dividends on that callable uh, stock uh, up and until they ever do call it, if they ever call it. I really don't know if there's more to it than that or not. You know, I didn't really think about that until just the other day. I'm glad you brought that up because it's uh, definitely something he's going to have to get education on, and he's a pretty bright kid, and, uh, you know, as long as I'm right, he'll be able to figure it out that I'm all right the way I've got it laid out. Yeah, that that's important for me too. Is like the um, like setting like I I have an investment account for the five month old and and the wife and I have already decided that whatever like tax credit because he was born in January so we we didn't file the twenty twenty two taxes with him so we don't know what like how much that's going to increase our tax return um, but we've decided that we're going to figure out what the increase of having him on our tax return is going to be and then every year from now until he's eighteen that additional money that he's causing us to get on our taxes is what we're going to put in his, his account as his investment account. Um, and that'll be, you know, 18 years worth of, I don't know, a thousand dollars or whatever it is where it's going to grow. We, I, right now I'm just having him in, I think he's in V O O and Q Q Q M or maybe just Q Q Q. I'm just like, I, I don't feel like managing another portfolio. So I just put him in, you know, ETFs and let it grow. Um, once he gets old enough that he's sitting down and he's asking me like what I'm doing and stuff like that, I'll start teaching him a little bit. Um, and then hopefully, you know, he takes to it and it's just like, okay, like I, um, he likes this brand or all the kids at school are talking about this brand or whatever. And we can look into it and see if it's a good buy. And, you know, I'll advise him a little closer in the beginning just to like tell him why we're not going to buy that stock that he brought up or tell him why we can buy that stock, like what it meant, like kind of set like criteria, like I was speaking about earlier. Um, and then you really get to it at the end, like, you know, when he gets, you know, in his teenage years where I'm like, okay, like after all the things that you've learned, like, I want you to identify a stock that you want to buy. Like you have whatever, $500, identify a stock you want to buy. Let me know what that stock is, why you want to buy and more or less like sell me on it. Um, and I want really want to see how he does that. I've seen people on like Facebook and stuff where they, uh, their kids will ask for something for like Christmas or their birthday or something. And the one kid actually yeah. put together like a PowerPoint and he was like describing like how this would make his life easier, why he wants it. Um, he did like, he put links on there where they could get it cheaper and stuff like that. And I was like, that's a really cool idea. Cause like, it, really, yeah, it teaches them like all the, all the different principles of like, you don't want them to think, okay, I have money. I put money in this thing and it becomes more money. You really want them to understand like, deeper and it doesn't necessarily need to be looking at balance sheets and stuff like that. Like that can be something that they learn on their own later or we can discuss later. But like in the, like, it's almost like the, um, what's the expression? Like the giving a kid one marshmallow now or getting them to wait five minutes and giving them two marshmallows. So yeah, that like delayed gratification and stuff like that, like that stuff's really, really big to me. So. Yeah. You know, I've uh, invested on behalf of them kids in five twenty nine plans and, uh, for my oldest, uh, it grew to uh, be a fairly substantial sum by the time she was ready to be in college, and she's already uh, she's already been able to spend several of the dollars. But in the meantime, the uh, account's also grown in value while she takes out a few thousand dollars to uh, pay for that semester. As she gets geared up to go again, the uh, portfolio has increased that set of investments that is has increased in value again. So it's time to pay that bill come August that, uh, and in my boy's account, he's in a similar mix, but, uh, he's just, uh, been able to, uh, roll right along with, with, uh, my oldest uh, account. Uh, it's a state sponsored plan as it is. And it's not, uh, not the worst thing you can do for a kid to uh, set aside money for them. Now I do invest on their behalf. I think, what is it? I've got about $50 taken out of every check that goes into their accounts. And then, you know, my boys has a drip. My daughter has a drip still. And, uh, you know, what was really interesting was like, I hate to name companies, but I got my son into realty income and they spun off something called uh, office so office properties read and so he's got realty income and he's got this other company that are both paying more dividends and he gets more 
shares every month. And uh, my daughter, I had her in a company called Duke Realty. And uh, the punchline to that was it was acquired by Prologis Realty last year. And uh, not only did she get quite a few shares of Prologis, but uh, she's getting a pretty substantial dividend check every quarter coming up this month too, I think. But, uh, you know. Uh, so does your daughter, like, how old your daughter? She's in college, so she's got like... Yeah, she's, she's a little older than 18. She'll be, well, we are on the air here, but yeah, she'll be 22 here coming up. Okay, so like, does she... Because I don't know, I know they say kids have a hard time, like, valuing the future because, like, everything's just so right now for kids. So, like, the, is your daughter old enough to understand that, like, the dividends are coming in and, like, actually looking at that and, like, understanding, like, the inner workings of it? Or does she just see it as these things are giving me money that I'm using to pay for college? No, uh, she knows where it comes from and... uh you know, she even has an account set up that she's directing her own uh, money into to buy stocks that she'll run something by me from time to time. But uh, most of the time I said, well, why do you want to do this? And, you know, you get down to uh, to uh, what the reasoning is behind she her thoughts on uh, different investments. Um, we went to an annual meeting. Uh, oh, I guess it's been a year ago. And and. Uh, at the same time, ran into another company that she's been interested in ever since, and uh, they had a, uh, a presentation at the same time. and And I've bought a few shares of, of this uh, company as well, but uh, she uh, definitely gets her own ideas and uh, has uh, just kind of like runs it by me. But that's about it. My boy, he wanted to buy stock in Roblox, if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. It's a game he spends quite a bit of time on, but uh, I found that we could get a little bit for him in a fractional share program. And so, you know, we get $2, $10 worth of Roblox here and there. But, you know, I always say, you know, this, it's just not looking pretty and it doesn't really seem to be what it used to be. You know, is it, is it going to continue the way it is? Or, you know, is this thing here to stay? Or is this something that's just going to go the way of the... Uh, the Atari video game console, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that is cool though, that your daughter is in college. She, she, re cause like that, there's two different, there, I mean, I'm sure there's more than two different ways, but there, there's the two different ways that I'm thinking of that she could look at it like, Oh, okay. You know, my dad set this up for me. Like, that's cool. I just know that, um, when I need money, I go to this account and it pays for my college or the way she, she sounds like she's taking it where she's like, okay, like, I understand how this works. I understand what it's doing. I understand the benefits of it. Also, she understands it enough that she's taking it upon herself to start her own thing off to the side. That's, you know, outside of the, the five two nine plan, which is super cool. So right. sounds like you did a good job there. So congratulations. Well, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's been a work in progress, but you know, it's, it's going to bear, bear some fruit down the line. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it'll, yeah, exactly. And like I, you, I don't know that I heard this as much. I, I feel like, a, I don't know, what, whatever that sin or whatever that thing is where like when you buy that car, or when you start looking at the car, you drive around on the highway and see like all those cars, like tons of them. Um, yeah. It's like that with dividend investing too. Cause like, I, I feel like I heard this or this will pay you dividends or whatever before, but now it doesn't matter what I watch. You could be watching a sitcom. You could be watching reality TV. You could be watching sports or broadcasting or whatever. And somebody says something about, oh, you know, that's going to give you dividends in the future. And nobody like until you're in it, you never really like understand, like, what are they talking about? They're talking about like doing whatever action you're doing today will end up benefiting you exponentially more in the future. That's literally what the term like it's going to pay you dividends in the future. Um, and when you, you know, like I said, when you're in it or when you if you start if you're watching this and you start really listening to a lot of things that you hear you'll hear people say that phrase and that's where it comes from. Like that's what it is. And it's, it's pretty much sure if you can get in pretty soon too. But, um, okay. So, um, let's go with the next one. So, okay. Next question for you. How do you balance the desire for higher dividend yields with the need to invest in stable and reliable companies? Not to say that, you know, you're 
higher dividend yields can't also be stable, reliable companies, but in the world where they're different, how do you, how do you balance that for your own portfolio? Okay. Give me that one more time. I'm sorry. So how do you balance the desire for high yield dividend stocks with the need to invest in stable and reliable companies? Well, you know, uh, it comes to me pretty easily. I, I hate to, uh, say it that way because, you know, it's, it's going back to that balance deal again. Uh, you're going to need just a little bit of everything to, uh, make everything work out the way it will. And, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've got some stuff automated kind of like the 401k I've got different asset classes in there and some of that stuff, small cap, large cap value, uh, blend, something in the middle there. Blend works out pretty well sometimes, but, uh, not always. You just have to figure out what it is that they're, that they're putting the money in, in the 401k, but, uh, it is about uh, striking a balance that uh, it's not necessarily even in terms of dollars, but it's just in terms of opportunity. If you, uh, if you're patient and you can wait on the opportunity to come and it will, because it always does, you know, it's going to, uh, it's going to work out, you know, it's just, uh, I hate to tell you, but, Past performance doesn't indicate future results, but, uh, you know, past behavior does kind of dictate future results. If you do the right thing, then uh, everything's going to work out just fine. Yeah, I've, I've said that same thing in the past because, like, I, my Power Fives that I release every Friday, like, one of the, the big one of the big metrics I use in there and one of the big metrics I use for my own personal picks is outperforming the S&P over the last 10 years. And... I get a lot of uh, a lot of comments back and forth on Facebook on when, when I post those, and they're like, you know, past performance doesn't you know guarantee future success, and like, I agree, and that's obvious because nothing is guaranteed. But like, would you rather own a company that has never outperformed the market, but they promise to the next decade, or would you rather own a company that's always outperformed the market and they predict to keep doing so? Like, that's kind of where where I come from with that. So I'm I'm definitely in your camp on the the past for past performance kind of thing like it's it's not necessarily the performance that'll be duplicated it's the characteristics and the principles that they use to outperform that can be duplicated yeah if 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 you have a plan and you stick to that plan and uh you sustain that plan you know it's it's uh you work the plan you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i like that a lot um okay so do you okay? Here's here's another new question for you. Do you have any favorite dividend stocks or sectors that you particularly enjoy investing in, or sectors that you stay away from? Stuff I stay away from, not so much. But yeah, you know, lately I've been looking at uh, energy companies, whether it's natural gas or uh, midstream players or uh, oil producers or even convenience stores. To be honest with you. I like uh, real estate investment trusts, and I like a few closed-end funds that focus on uh, providing income, whether it's from uh, you know a portfolio of uh, other stocks or a portfolio of uh, investment-grade debt or whatever it is that they pursue. I've I've been reading a lot about uh, some closed-end funds lately um, that are more on the uh, and business development companies, I think. I don't know if I need to put out any tickers here or not, but yeah, you something can put, if you I've have really any done. For you, you can put them out. I don't care. Um, PSP is something that I've really taken an interest in lately. And what it is is a private equity closed-in fund from Invesco that invests in several private equity companies worldwide. And I think that these are the incubators of tomorrow's leading companies. And uh, I really think there's something to private equity groups. I like uh, some of these other BDCs like Main Street Capital, um, ticker simple MAIN, and, uh, you know, the the Bain Capital one, I think, is uh, interesting. 
BCSF. So with BDCs are taxed differently, are they not? Just it just depends. A lot of times they are, yes. So do you do you val like do you consider that when you add those to your portfolio or is that like we'll worry about that at a later time or how do you handle that? Well, usually it's I worry about it at a later time. I've got a a tax preparer that's uh very good to me and uh she has uh advised me pretty well as far as stuff that she says, you know, I don't want to have to do another one of those again if you could see your way to uh finding something different and uh I've taken her advice pretty seriously. Um, but uh, normally, I uh, don't let taxes dictate my investments because whether you're dealing with return of capital or a K-1 statement or whatever it is that turns you off about an investment, you know, it'll, you have good professionals on your side. They'll help you work, work it out. And if you owe, I mean, sometimes you will owe uh, Oh, what is it? Uh, oh, it's that alternative minimum tax on some things. I've never run into that except for on some uh, property that I've had, but uh, but I uh, have uh, read about it. So it, I know that's something that I'd probably steer clear of. It's just having to pay tax on money you don't make because the company did make money or the fund did make money. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the taxes on certain things. Taxes on certain things are just like, it's almost like the fear of the unknown for me. Like I, I personally stay away from real estate for that. That's like the main reason. Cause like I would want to hold it in a tax deferred account. So my HSA, my 401k or my, my Roth, sure. but I, so I don't, okay. I don't necessarily steer away from real estate cause I have VNQ, which is a real estate ETF real in my Roth. Yeah. Um, but I don't own any, any individual tickers of real estate because most of what I'm building is in my taxable account. And not that it would get to the point where like it changes my tax bracket, at least for a while it wouldn't. Um, but for the time being, I'm just like, okay, like I'll continue to learn about those things. And I feel like that's going to be like a, uh, a pin I pull when the time gets closer to needing it, which like you said, your mm -hmm. long-term and short-term are actually starting to get like closer together. Um, my long-term and short-term are still distinctly apart from each other. So like, that's kind of one of those things like, okay, I might go into more BDCs or, um, or, or real estate as I get closer to my goal if I need to. Um, so I guess I'll cross that bridge when I get there, kind of like you are with the tax situation too. Yeah. And at least, you know, that's where you are, bud. Uh, cause, uh, that's important. Yeah. The, the only sector I really... Like I said, I don't technically steer away from real estate. I own a house and I have that VNQ. The only sector I steer away from, like I I don't know if there's anything good in this sector, is the communication sector. Like I feel like every stock I look at there is just like not good. You're just talking about the carriers or are you just talking about... Uh... Like al almost in general. So uh, I don't even know if I want to recommend this or not, but... Way back on my channel, I did a versus series, which I, I am really big into like a lot of like deeper level thinking. Like I don't really have, which I feel like is really hard to make content for. Cause like you have to have a, a level of understanding to understand even what I'm talking about in certain videos. Mm -hmm. So way back when I did a versus series and I started it with like your typical versus series that you see on YouTube, which is like home Depot versus Lowe's, like which one's better. But that was surface level. And I was like, okay, like what can I give that's even more valuable? The reason I don't want to recommend this is because the quality of these videos, as far as like what you're seeing, not good. Um, I, I was standing up, I was talking in an echoey room and like, it's the same room I'm recording in now, but I didn't have a microphone, didn't have a webcam, like all those things. So video editing, very bad, but I think the content's still very good. And what I did with each of those is I literally went through every dividend paying stock in every sector. So I broke out the sectors by all the dividends that pay this sector, all the dividends that pay at this sector, whatever. And I went through and I organized them by market cap. And then I went through market cap, or I went through all of the stocks, put them in order of smallest to largest market cap. Then I went through and there was, I don't even remember, it was so long ago. I don't remember how many um, different categories I had, but I had different categories that the goal was to tell me, basically just let the numbers tell the story of which stock was going to be the best stock in each sector. So if you, anybody wants to go back and watch those playlists, I think I made a playlist called the versus series on, on the channel. 
and there's literally yeah, I'm seeing it. yeah it's it's uh like i said not great editing however the content's still really good and i think i found some like really good stocks i was actually going to go back through there um I might do it next year because I think I've already passed like the half, the, the year mark for a lot of those videos I put out. So I might just do it mm -hmm. next year where I go back through and like do a two year report on like the stocks that I said was the best in each sector and like kind of compare it to the other ones that were in the sector and see if it's actually be like outperformed. And I could really do that like five years down, 10 years down and like see how it's actually performing over the long haul and see, you know see if I was onto something or not. But yeah, all yeah, that to say, imagine you'll learn something doing that. Do what? You'll probably learn something yourself just doing that. Exactly. Yeah. Like there's going to be certain metrics that I thought would like indicate whether it would perform well or not. And you know, it doesn't mean anything or there's going to be certain metrics that I used and I'm like, man, I was really, I was really onto something like too bad. I didn't listen to my own advice, but, um, cause I mean, that's the thing. Like I've had the same holdings in my own portfolio for like a, I don't know, the last two years or so. And I'm not in the other outside of Costco and NVIDIA, like that, that transaction, I've just been adding to the same positions. Like I haven't added any new positions. So like, I don't want people to be like, oh yeah, you know, Troy's just out here recommending stocks on his power fives or whatever. And he's not, you know, taking his own advice. That's why I do those transparent portfolio recaps. So you guys can see exactly what I do, how I do, when I do. Um, but it's also like. I realize that everybody doesn't invest the same way I do. Like not everybody's at the same point of the journey. They don't have the same mindset for better or for worse. Um, so I just put the content out for everybody else to enjoy. And if you get something out of it, that's the goal. So um, yeah, those, those versus series are very entertaining. Cause um, I don't remember who the winner in the communications sector was, but I, I don't know. Yeah. The carriers to answer your question, like AT&T and Verizon, I know they're super popular in like every group I'm in. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't see what you see. Like it's, the debts on them are crazy high. The dividend yields are high. The returns on them are crazy low. I'm like, what are we buying? Like, what are we, what are we doing? That is interesting because uh, each of those, uh, well, I've looked at Verizon and AT&T, but uh, I just uh, get less and less enchanted with either of them, to be honest with you these days. Yeah. I mean, going, going back to what you were saying earlier in the, in the discussion where we were talking about like buying what you know, like a lot of people would do that. Like, oh, I have, you know, my phones with, with AT&T or whoever. And like, um, it, that's why it's not like a blanket thing. Like, oh, okay, just because I see this product in my house means I need to go buy that company. It's, it's a good starting point because there's plenty of like exa exactly like my Power Fives that I put out every week. Um, I had somebody talk to, or they, they were under the assumption that I put out those videos to do the dividend capture strategy because I talk about the X dividend date. And I and actually Chad came to my defense and he was like, Troy doesn't talk about the dividend capture strategy at all. The only reason I even talk about the X dividend date is because I needed a starting point list. Like I needed a list that changed every week that I could then do my manipulation to to, to give people, you know, the information that that is true. Um and X dividend date that changes every week. I was like, okay, there's going to be a new list of stocks every week that come up with new X dividend dates. So I was like, okay, that's where I'll start. And then I'll just base my list off of that. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's same thing. Like you said, it's a starting point with your research of like making sure you maybe invest in things that you're a consumer of. However, it's a maybe invest cause you have to do additional research. And like, if you look, take 10 seconds to look at the AT&T or Verizon charts over the last 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to be real disappointed to see that you've either, uh, I think in some cases you'd actually lose money, um, depending on when yeah. your, your time frame is. So. Yeah. And I was a customer of one and am now a customer of the other. So I've yeah. got that going as far as the experience with the product, I've got that too, but really they're, they're just, uh, there's just a lot there that doesn't add up for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So I, I'm glad I'm not the, I'm not, glad I'm not the only one there. I feel like every time I pick on, uh, pick on a stock it's always AT&T and Verizon but those are just two I know it'll uh not necessarily hit home with a lot of people but a lot of people have one heard of both of those companies two sure. some, most people invest in some of those companies three like they're commonly talked about so I was like okay I don't want to come off with some off the wall company that nobody's ever heard of because they won't be able to relate that to anything so uh sorry if you're an AT&T or Verizon holder whoever's watching I'm not picking on you it's just those are easy stocks but um Okay, so next one. How do you manage risk in your dividend portfolio? And then are there any specific strategies or diversification techniques that you follow? Yeah, that's that's just it. It's about the selection of 
the, uh, you know, when I decide to uh, add to a position or send a check in for one of those rips. Um, a lot of times I uh, only send the checks in. You know, I say checks. The most of this stuff's automated and through the website and that kind of thing. But mm. I used to send in checks years ago. That's the deal. But uh, um, I take a look at where it's been in the last year as far as high and low. And sometimes some of them are in a little bit better place than some of my other alternatives. But uh, and current news, things that are going to come come up and uh or things i'm expecting i should say i don't really pay attention when earnings come out on everything that i've got a piece of but but a lot of times it's just entertaining to uh hear what uh, management has to say when they do have a report um uh, got another ticker to put out there epr is entertainment properties trust um which we've been involved with since they went public back in the late 90s, I think 97. It's just very interesting to follow along with, and it's also a real estate investment trust. Um, but uh, when I'm evaluating to add more to something like that, you know, it's off of its high for the year. It's definitely off of its low for the year, so it's been a reasonable consideration so far. So even even if it isn't somewhere in the middle, you just kind of figure out where it's been and where it's where it uh, hasn't been, and you know whether or not to uh, commit some funds to uh, another investment. Yeah, that's a that's a cool. I never I never thought about because I I just dollar cost average every day, but that is a cool right. way to think about it as far as. Wanting a stock to not be on its high because then, you know, you could just be, you know, buying it when it's soaring past what, what it should be. Um, and then also not buying a stock that's at the low because then you could be, you know, trying to catch a falling knife where you're like, okay, this is the bottom. Um, where that's really mitigated if you do buy, you know, um, like say you watch a power five of mine and uh, the last category is always the stock that's the highest percentage off of their 52 week high. So you might not necessarily be in a low, but that could be in the sweet spot that you're talking about where it's like, okay, like it's, it showed support that it could reach whatever level it was at, what's changed since it's been there. And maybe it's not on its low and it's somewhere in the middle and you know, it could still be falling and it could make a new low or it could be like, okay, it went up too fast. It's out of its support. It came back down, you know, 20, 30, 40%. And now is it going to go up like another 10%? Like maybe you did it overcorrect or something like that. So that's a cool way to think about it. Um, okay. So next one for you. This is going to be a fun one. Are there any common misconceptions or myths about dividend investing that you would like to debunk? Misconceptions about dividend investing. Uh, hmm. I don't know that I've got a real good answer for you there about that because my experience has uh, shown that uh, most of the things that I've committed to are things that I'm going to be committed to. So I suppose if you look at that, the misconception is, is uh, hmm. I'm sorry, Troy. No, I, I hear a lot of people, like, for example, one I hear all the time is like dividend investing for, it's like an old person's game. And I like, I always have to argue that. I'm just like, I don't under, I understand how somebody could say that you can use dividend investing in advanced age, like as a supplemental income, but like starting dividend investing when you're really young is you could probably argue more beneficial because you have all those years of compounding of not only the the assets capital appreciation but the dividend the dividend growth rate and all the things yeah i think you're on to something there uh, um that same grandpa that thought uh that uh joining in the walmart plan was definitely an older fella by the time he was retiring from uh the uh electric company and uh you know, it was his game, though, and he really led by example, as far as I'm concerned, um, that that was the way you were going to do well. And uh, 
there's no misconception about it. He really proved it by by his example that uh, it was just a really wise path for me to take. Yeah, yeah I'm, and you hear the other one. I, I was just thinking while you were saying that, like the, the what's the story? There's that one gas gas station attendant that ended up becoming a multi millionaire because like he just worked he put his money back he list, lived on less than he made and he just put little bits amount over long periods of time so like a, one of the the myths or misconceptions is that like you see a lot of people i see it all over youtube with other dividend channels where they constantly t they talk about right now and they're like oh how much money would you need to put in right now to make fifty thousand dollars a year in dividends from this company i'm like is it about right now because what you're doing is you're capturing the wrong audience with those videos the, True. the people that are watching that are the young people. And what they see is one that they can invest in higher yielding stocks at a young age and make a lot of money quick, which is what we talked about earlier. And then the other thing they see. So if they don't see that, the other thing they see is I don't have $50,000 to invest in whatever company. That's what they see. Both of yeah. which are, uh, Un, they're they're less than preferred in their own ways. One person never starts, and the other person starts, and they go down the rabbit hole of investing in things that aren't right for their timeline. So that's just my little uh, soapbox there. Both of those things bother me a lot. Um, okay, yeah, there's something to do that. Do do what? There's something to that. I mean, uh, you know, if uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my track. I'm sorry. No, you're okay. Yeah, it's it's the yeah. I don't I don't know. It, it's just I I um I could have grown the I, the YouTube channel is growing. It's slower than I thought it. I thought it'd be a lot easier of a process than it is. But I could have. Uh, I I tell my cousin this all the time. I'm like, yeah, you know, I could have grown the YouTube channel a lot quicker. I put out a bunch of calculations on like, oh, if I buy this much this many shares of Jeppy, I'm gonna make this much money. I'm like, okay, like. First of all, that's just a simple calculation. Why would I waste people's time when they can do the same thing I just did? Um, and then the other thing is just like, I feel like the people that watch that video are the ones that don't need to see that video, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it does. And I see a few of those too. And, you know, pretty soon I move on to something that's next because uh, it's just, it's good information, but it's it's just kind of useless. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. What, like it. Literally, it, they make a 10, 15 minute video that's literally, it's not like they use this bit of re research to, to figure out this and like they're solving for X a bunch of times. They're just quite yeah. literally, you have $50,000. This company pays 10% yield. This is how much money that'll generate. I'm like, why do we need a video on this? And like I said, the they're just doing it because they don't have any ideas for content. But what the the unintended or maybe intended consequences, the people that it's attracting. And that's what I don't want to support. So like I told my cousin is like, I could make videos like that and it would help me grow. Cause all those videos I see get thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of views. But I'm like, I don't, I would rather grow slower and give people quality content that you can use depending on your age and timeline and, you know, just grow the long way, kind of like dividends. Like I could do the same thing where I invest all my money into Jeppy and I could make way over a hundred dollars a month. Or I can do it slow and steady, and you know, in the long run, I'll probably end up being better off anyway. So, um, and maybe not in Jeffy, but certainly in a in a several ETFs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you have, yeah, like there's all these premium income and ETFs and stuff, and these people have thirty years until they need the income, and they're the same people that when their stock goes down two percent, they're losing their mind because they're like, oh my gosh, my now you know I had. I had a hundred dollars. Now I have $98 and I, I don't want to lose any money. I'm going to sell or whatever. And I'm like, do you need the money today? Like you have to ask yourself those questions. Like if you were going to buy it yesterday at a hundred dollars, say you, I always try to like relate it to TVs. If you were going to go to Walmart and buy a television and yesterday that TV was $200 and you were like, okay, I want to buy that. Oh, maybe you didn't have, you know, the right car. You couldn't get the car. You couldn't get the TV in the car. So you're like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. If the TV is now $150 or you can be like, I don't want that TV anymore. You're like, Hey, good news for me. The TV is now cheaper than it was yesterday. I'm going to buy more of it or not. Maybe buy, buy another TV, but you're going to buy that TV and have $50 extra. Like that's yeah. my analogy. I use for dividend stocks. Like to me, I have Apple, I have Microsoft, Starbucks, Visa, Exxon whatever. When I'm buying these companies, if those companies were 
$100 yesterday and then I come in today and it's $98. Now I was going to spend $100 to get a share, but now I'm going to get a little bit more than a share because I'm still spending $100. So I, I don't know. That's just the way I think of it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm the weirdo, but. Oh, no, not at all. Okay. Well, that makes me feel a little better. So, <laughs> um, okay. So here, here goes this one. So what, this is the, you know, typical, typical interview question. What advice would you give someone who is just getting started in their own dividend journey? Well, you've got to do some research. You're going to have to read and take an interest in what you're doing. And at the end of the day, when you finally do it, you have got to give it your entire commitment. Mm -hmm. That's something that I've thought through as to uh, what I do tell some people that want to do it. I've got a coworker that uh, got the 401k enrollment package and, uh, said, you're just going to have to do it. Not only are you going to have to do it, but you're going to have to do it enough to get your company match and to get uh, to get uh, where you're aiming to go, which in her case is the year 2065. Yeah. So I said, it's going to take a few dollars to get from where you are to where you're headed. But along the way, you're going to have to take the uh, matching contribution, but you're also going to have to commit to doing it. I said, if it takes you doing another shift, another half shift, coming in for somebody or staying over for somebody late so they can come in late, then you do that. And it, it all has to be with that in-line goal in mind of saving enough for that 2065. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, I had the video that was like the path to retirement or something like that. And I, I talked um, about that where like, the importance of getting that company match in your 401k. Like that's so that's, that's a guaranteed, whatever that re, that match guaranteed is return. guaranteed return. Like I, mine's three for three. So I don't have like, mine's not great. Um, but that's still 3%. I'm basically doubling my money every, like anytime I put money in, I'm doubling it. If I put 50 bucks in, there's a hundred dollars in that account right away. Cause exactly. the company did the same thing. And I'm just like, that's so, so worth it. And then the other thing is like, you have, um, a lot of companies will do, they, they might not change their, uh, their match. Like it's still always going to be three for three, but as you like, say you get your, you know, obligatory 2% raise every year or 3% raise or 4%. Yeah, raise or whatever. yeah. A lot of companies will actually increase your contributions by 1% with that raise. So you're going to still make more money per paycheck. Cause at the end of the day, the, the cool thing about the 401k is it's pre-tax and it's out of your paycheck before you knew what your paycheck was. So okay. it's almost like you're not missing money because you didn't know you had it. Um, and if like my my first company I worked at did that where it was like every year. Now you could opt out of it, but like you started year one and it was I think the match was if I contributed six percent, they would do four and a half. So like the next year they bumped my contribution to seven percent, but I got like a so it was only one percent pre tax, but I got like a I don't know three percent raise. So. I was still making more on my paycheck to signal to me I did get a raise, but I'm also now contributing more money, one, because the percentage is higher, and two, because the amount I'm making is higher, so a bigger a percentage of a bigger number is a bigger number. So, um, yeah. It's, a little more compounding going on. Yeah, exactly. And like like we already talked about earlier, like the compounding of starting starting as soon as you can. Like I, I, I talked in a previous interview, like the – the issue is a lot of people don't worry about retirement and not necessarily until it's too late, but it's too late to, to fully absorb like the, the full grasp of like the compounding. Cause like, they're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to retire at 65. Like maybe when they turn 50, they meet with somebody at their office or in their, in their uh, company. That's like, Hey, you know, let's start worried. Like, like we need to make sure we're getting on this retirement train and like really start planning for that. And then they're like, Oh, okay. Like, they start then. And had they just done it where everybody just automatically enrolled in a 401k when they start an employer and you have to make the conscious effort to unenroll, I feel like that would be a really, really big thing for, you know, the working class in general. But because, you know, everybody, right. I think right now how it is, is you have to actually opt in to 401ks. And I feel like they should just do everybody a solid because we don't know if social security is going to be here in 20 years. But uh, do everybody a solid and be like, Hey, we're going to opt you in from the rip. And if you have the mental, like if you can, if you know enough to say that you want to opt out of a 401k, I'm assuming you understand what a 401k is and what opting out means. Right. Um, I think yeah, um, my employer, uh, enrolls everybody from the get go. That's good. 
Yeah. I and like that. Uh, then some of them come to me wanting to know what to do. And the reason they come to me is because I've advised others in the past. And uh, that's that's my life, I guess. I got to tell you, I didn't say, say this at the beginning, but I was a financial advisor in another career. And my Series 7 and Series 66 passed and had a shingle out in an office in my uh, in the town that I work in. And uh, it is very important, you know, even uh, if uh, you get in that 401k, if you can find somebody that can advise you how to uh, take care of that or what options to choose to uh, start out with and even evaluate it as you go forward, that's, that's worth the nothing that you pay for that advice. But... Chances are, if you're in an index fund option, then you're probably going to be okay. But chances are, if you can do better with uh, some kind of foreign fund or or uh, large cap fund, smaller value fund, there's something in there for everybody. And uh, and you can figure out if you don't have uh, the inclination to visit with somebody that can help you. Mm-hmm. You can figure out what will work in your favor. Yeah. Yeah. That's good points. Like I, I, uh, I just recently helped my dad with it and he was asking me, you know, what do I do in it? The, the intimidating thing is there's all these, like he literally sent me a sheet of, I don't know, 30 options. Of course, you know, the first 15 of them are all target date funds and stuff like that. And, and I just, you know, I would told him, I was like, Hey, like they had, he actually had a dividend growth option in there, which I told him, I was like, I mean, you could do, 20% 20% of your money going into there. But I was like, for the meantime, like just to build a position, I was like, I would do something like VOO, like just put your, or whatever follows the S and P 500. I was like, just put that sure. in there. Um, and you know, build your position. Then as he, he either will gain an interest in it and then he'll be able to evaluate if he wants to change the hundred percent of S and P following fund to something else and like diversify into whatever else he wants to, or he won't gain an interest in it. And he will at least have a stable, solid investment choice from the rip. And that was my thought process behind it. But um, okay, so this is, I actually have a subscriber question for you. And this is from, uh, I don't know if it's Lewis or Luis, but he wants to know what do you think about newer folks using the dividend kings and aristocrats list when they first begin? You know, that's pretty uh, solid advice to uh, at least get some ideas to start with. Um, the uh, dividend kings, you know, they are kings because of the criteria that makes you a dividend king. I think what is it? You got to pay dividends for over 50 years. Yeah, it's a member of the S&P 500 and you have to pay for 50 years in a row. Pay and grow for 50 years in a row. And grow for 50 years. Yeah, I think Medtronic made that list back when I was evaluating uh, companies to put money into. Yeah, I think a book that I read was called investing in America's best companies or something to that effect. And, and that was, that was part of what they uh, keyed in on was doing dividend Kings. But uh, as I mentioned a little while ago, the insurance company I found in value line, which was a dividend contender, it's having, it's headed up to uh, King status here in a matter of just maybe another 15 years, they'll make King status. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where I always thought it would be at some point or even along the way, I kind of thought that's where we're headed with this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I agree. Uh, and, and Lewis, I, I think, I think there is something to be desired in some case. It depends on your age and your, not really your age as much as your timeline. Cause I don't really like to use age. Cause you could be 26 with a goal of retiring at 30. And I mean, yeah, you're 26, but you have four years. So your timeline's really close or, you could be 40 with a timeline of wanting to work till you're 80 and you have 40 years. So it really doesn't matter. The timeline matters more. Um, all that to say, I think that using the Kings and aristocrats list, um, typically there's, they're known to have, because they're so well established, you will see some lower growth in there. I think Tootsie Roll is actually still a dividend King. Um, fun really? fact, that's its own standalone company. Um, but their growth rate, both in terms of capital appreciation and their dividend, is um, you have to get a magnifying glass to see either one of them. It's very, very, very slow. Like they're literally doing the bare minimum to keep raising their dividend to keep their king status. 
even uh, if it's a penny at a time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes half a penny a time. Like they, they literally, right. as long as they're paying and increasing, like they stay on the list. And because they are part of the list, there are ETFs that track the king. I think there's an ETF that tracks the kings and the aristocrats, or maybe it just tracks one or the other. I'm not really sure. Um, but because there's stuff like that, like just keeping the status of a king or aristocrat is a beneficial to a lot of companies. So you can't like just... Because I, I was in the same boat. When I first started, I, I discovered the Kings and Aristocrats list. And I don't want to say I was necessarily blindly picking from the list, but I assumed because you were on this list that you were a stock that like it, you couldn't miss more or less. And all I want to say with that is there are stocks on there that are better or worse. So um, take that for what it's worth. But I, I do think it's a you're in the right mindset if you start from that list. It's just like I have videos talking about uh, – setting up a criteria and you can use my criteria if you want to, and you can tweak my criteria or whatever. I have videos on that as well. Um, but like finding the original list to look at and then filtering from there is way better. Cause there's just so many stocks to pick from, like whether they do or don't pay dividends, there's just so many. So if you can, like I do with the ex dividend date list, find a list and then narrow it down from there. You'll, it, it won't be as overwhelming, which is really nice. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brad for the answer on that one. And thank you, uh, Lewis or Luis for the question. So Brad, last question for you. And then I will let you carry on with your, uh, Saturday. Can you share any resources, books, or websites that have been helpful to you in your dividend investing journey? Yeah. You know, uh, what's the little Miller's book? Uh, the only investments, no, nope, that's not it. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, Lowell Miller wrote that uh, dividend book, and I'll put all these in the uh, in the in the show notes, the description down below. Uh, links. Yeah, and to I'll see if I can get you a title for that for later on. Okay. So you can put that in there, but uh, yeah, websites. I I do uh, browse Seeking Alpha. Yep. Um, uh, there are some pretty fair fairly great minds on there. In fact, I read a pretty good article today just before we went on the air. And, uh, you know, there's some, uh, there's also some people out there that you read them far enough and long enough along that, you know, that they think they know what they're talking about, but they really don't. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, and there's some of them that, you know, have their, their bullhorn on full blast and, uh, some of them that uh, are a little more uh, reserved in what they put out there, the commenters and comments on certain uh, articles that they put on there, I find uh, helpful as far as things I might want to question. They bring up points that not only do I want to know that about this article, I want to know that about this other company and why I should really consider using this metric or whatever it is. Uh, there's just a really good community on on Seeking Alpha. Way back in the very beginning, I was a Motley Fool, but there's just not a whole lot out there on Motley Fool anymore that I know of. Hmm. used to post on there often, but, uh, you know, we're talking about 90, 97, I think, was when I first got on there. I don't find much use in uh, the Yahoo message boards, but uh, Yahoo is a good resource to find uh, pricing ranges, uh, market caps, that kind of thing that you're screening for. Mm -hmm. And even uh, brokerage sites like Schwab, I've just uh, got involved in because they gobbled up TD Ameritrade. So uh, your brokerage sites like them and Fidelity is a pretty good mm -hmm. resource as well. Um, um, your YouTube channel, you know, is a good place to find ideas and, and kind of figure out how to think about certain certain uh, aspects of uh, dividend investing. I appreciate that. Shameless plug. That's fine. Uh, I found I find a lot of value with you, and I find value with several other uh, channels that are out there, but I've also found some real awful stuff out there, too. It's, you know, it kind of goes back to uh, uh, making content for the sake of having content mm -hmm. versus just having something out there that, you know, matters. Yeah. And the, the sad part is, uh, a lot of these, I, I have names I'm not going to mention cause it doesn't benefit. No, anybody, don't do but, that. Um, the, the, 
charisma that some of these content creators put out there um, gets people hooked. And those channels that I, you, I used to also follow those people. Um, and those channels are often the biggest ones that are putting out some of the worst information. Um, or they're just not really providing like the full the full background of like everything to consider. Like they, they put all the buzzwords and keywords and stuff in there that one get their videos views and clicks, but it also gets people excited when they watch it. And, you know, because they have, you know, something, something that people can attach to, whether it's their smile or they have a cool background or they got a cool niche or whatever that they're trying to, to tag onto. It's really, um, the, the, I will tell people from, from like doing it, sh putting out content on a consistent basis is hard. The longer somebody's been doing it, the more likely they are to um, be starting to scratch the bottom of the barrel, if that makes sense, where they're just putting yeah. out content to put out content. And you really have not to say, you know, somebody has a YouTube channel for 10 years, their their content's now trash. That's not how that works. But like you really have to evaluate and don't take somebody's word on YouTube. So for for instance, me being young, a lot of people watch my YouTube channel and they're like, oh, I don't want to take investing advice from some guy that just started, you know, three years ago or some young kid or whatever it might be. I'm not asking anybody to take anything I say as advice. All I want to do is serve as a springboard for you to do your own research. Um, and like, that's what I really like about the power fives. Like the one I just put out yesterday, there's some stocks that I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about on dividend groups on Facebook or whatever, like th a couple stocks I put on there. And I was like, I don't know if this is like, if you look into it for another 20 minutes, you might be like, okay, this stock, you know, is good or it's not a good price right now, or it's not for me or whatever it might be. Um, but then some of them, you could be like, I've never heard of this stock and it meets this criteria, this criteria, this criteria. I might like look into like seeing what a purchase price might be for me. Like maybe you're a, one of the people that likes to start at a certain price or whatever that might be. So um, all that to say, be really careful of what you find anywhere, whether it is Seeking Alpha, Motley Fool, YouTube, uh, Google. Or even the library. Yeah, exactly. Like always use those as springboards for you to conduct your own research. Like it, I think using all these resources as um, whether it's a book and you're learning skills or different ways to evaluate or whether it's content on YouTube or, or the internet use those as basis to get like a general list of things that you can then expand on and do your own research on. Cause that's really important. But yeah. anyway, um, I, I get on my soapbox a lot cause I, I just see a lot, a lot of those people fall. A lot of the people that shouldn't be watching some of the people they watch, they watch them. They don't know enough to, to know enough, if that makes sense. And then they, you know, fall into yeah. these traps. It takes years and years to get out of if they ever get out of it. And then, um, I hear a lot of people getting like scammed in investing and then like I, I get scammed several times. Not I get scammed. I get people try to scam me several different times on like Facebook messenger and stuff. And I respond to all of the people that message me cause I don't know if they're from the channel or groups or whatever. Um, and they'll be talking, you know, they talk about like what kind of investor I am or this or that. And, and I always end up, um, I talk to these people and I tell them like, Hey, I don't really appreciate what you're doing because investing is already a topic that a lot of people don't spend time in, um, because it's scary. It's intimidating. And then you have people like this that are preying on people's ignorance and they end up getting those people that already don't want to invest. If they can trick them into investing, the style of investing that they're presenting is a scam. And then they think all investing is a scam. And I tell them this all the time. I'm like, you guys aren't doing a service to anybody. So, um, yeah. I don't know if that's rude to do or not, but I also think it's rude that these people prey on people that don't know better. So it is. And, uh, you know, I'll just relate a story. I was solicited on, uh, on a message board, uh, elsewhere. Okay. I'll tell you it was on public.com. If you're familiar with that place, uh -huh. but, uh, you know, they put up a pretty picture and, and, uh, tell you about how they can, tell you how to uh, win the whole investment game using their strategy. As long as I could part with $3,000, they can turn that into $6,000. It's just ignorant, to be honest, but uh, I don't care for anybody on there like that. But a lot of them, their uh, profile goes away because other people report them too. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And I mean, at the end of the day, we're never going to, you know, catch them all or whatever. It's not Pokemon, but like you have to, 
be be cautious about it. And like I said, that's why whether it's a person that's got good intentions or bad intentions, like it's always important to do your own research. If I recommend a stock, I don't want you going out there and just buying it because Troy was talking about it or I heard about it on Dividend Obsession because what happens is if you buy that stock for $100, it goes down 5%. Then you're like, oh, I knew I shouldn't have listened to that. That's why you have to convict yourself and, and have your own convictions. And you're like, okay, I heard about this stock from Troy. I heard about it on Dividend Obsession. I determined that I like it for these reasons. And if it goes down $5, 5%, whatever it is, you're not worried about selling it because you still like all the reasons you bought it. So then it's just a buying opportunity. So that's very important. The lesson I've learned over the years as well is that don't buy, don't buy a stock because somebody else said that they, they like it or whatever, like see if it's right for you. But yeah, I'd have to recommend that if you, uh, do find something that you find a recommendation that you want to invest in or investigate further. You know, you need to make some notes about this, whether you do it on paper or you just jot it out in a text message to yourself or even in a note on notepad, just figure out what it is that appeals to you about it. And, and uh, you can talk yourself into anything, but it's a lot easier to talk yourself into it. If you've already got the reasoning down and, uh, you can back your own play. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, a little, I just thought about this. Another uh, barrier to entry that you could do um, it, it talking about exactly what Brad was just talking about. Um, send yourself that text message or write yourself that note when you first discover a stock and then don't do any research on that stock until the market's closed. Oh, no doubt. Because what you're going to end up doing is you might end up like, you might find one or two things that makes you super excited about a stock and you buy it, but then you go to the next page and there's 10 bad things about it. You're like, okay, I don't know if I want to buy it anymore. So like um, a little, that could be like a little trick somebody uses is like, okay, um, say you watch my video on Friday when it comes out at four o'clock central time, the market's closed. And I do those on purpose. That way you have Friday night, you have Saturday, you have Sunday, any day that's convenient for you to do your research and while the market's closed, you're not going to make any any rash decisions. And if you like it, you can buy it on Monday when the market opens with all your justifications of why you want to buy it. And then as a little cherry on top, it has an X dividend date that's coming up that week and you'll get paid from it sooner rather than later as well. So um, that's really the main reason I release those on Friday is because the market closes and I don't want anybody making any rash decisions and, and buying a stock just because you know they heard it, heard it on dividend obsession or anything. So that's actually a I just thought of that when you were talking. I was like, that's kind of a good idea. Well, I've done it myself. And, uh, you know, I've got pages of uh, notes in my phone. I've even got some that I'll, that I'll email myself the note and uh, put it into a document here. And, you know, I open one and it's on Hormel. And I open another and it has observations about 3M or something like that. And they have their own files. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really good idea. I like that a lot. So, but anyway, Brad, I want to say thank you very, very much for coming on this episode of Dividend Discussion. It has been a blast to talk to you. Um, I learned a lot. I hope you took something away from this interview and I hope everybody you know that's what? watching took something away. Um, like I said, the goal of this is to be able to put something in your proverbial dividend tool belt, whether it was from me, Brad, the combination of the two of us, whether it's something you could think about uh, and use to make yourself a better dividend investor. Thank you all so much for watching today's interview. If you're still here, please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel so you can continue to add tools to your tool belt to make you a better dividend investor. Lastly, if you would like a chance to be on an episode of Dividend Discussion, send me an email at dividendobsession at gmail.com and I'll be in touch. But until next time, see you.